All right, Rodney James here for Cage Side Press, joined by former UFC fighter, American top team coach, Dean Thomas. And that's just one, that's just a few of your titles, brother. Man, I don't, I just, I wish my title was just Dean Thomas, you know what I'm saying? Like, because I don't ever want to be trapped into something, you know, say, oh, he's an MMA coach or he's this, he's that. I just want to be Dean that can do all, do it all. Actor, comedian, and he's also on Dana White's Looking for a Fight, which is actually what brought you to uh, Austin, Texas right now, because I know y'all were uh, covering an LFA fight. And I mean, obviously can't talk too much about that because you can't give spoilers out for the TV show, but um, what, what was, how's your experience been, man? I know that show looks like a lot of fun to uh, film. It, it is, man. And I think we finally got the our rhythm and our chemistry down. And it was tough because, you know, I've been actually been on the show for two years now, but we haven't filmed that much just because of, you know, scheduling conflicts. But this was the first time where it actually just felt really easy for all of us to just be in sync with each other and to have chemistry. So if you thought any of the other episodes were cool, that was purely editing. <laughs> the, the, the crew does a great job of editing the show, but I think this time, um, we made it really easy for them to edit and we just, we have a lot of good content and I know everybody's going to enjoy it. Uh, so did, did we, uh, are we, we going to get, uh, are we going to have some great fights to look forward to on this, uh, episode? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, the guys, yeah, I mean, there were some, there were some great fights. I don't know, you know, if you, if you watched the LFA, there was, there was too much, uh, there was too much going on everywhere else. You had one FC, you had Bellator, you had UFC. <laughs> I couldn't keep it, up with it all. It was a strong weekend, yeah. Without a doubt, it was a strong weekend without a doubt for MMA. But you know, if you're if you're a nerd and you happen to catch the LFA event um, on Access TV, I mean, there were some great fights. So we we enjoyed ourselves. We had a good time. Cool, man. So yeah. So speaking of a busy weekend, man, like you had a busy weekend, and also, I mean, just just in your neck of the woods with American Top Team, uh, with the TV show. Uh, that we just talked about, you, you got a lot going on, a lot of news in uh, in your neck of the woods, a lot of fight announcements for American Top Team this week. Yes. <laughs> for International Fight Week, you are going to be a busy guy. Yeah, you know, it, it's fun. Like, um, we knew this was coming. You're like, it's it's always busy for American Top Team, but it, it's, it's moments like this that even – amaze me you know that even i'm in awe of when they're like all right junior dos santos is fighting francis and gano you know amanda nunez is fighting holly Holm. i mean i'm just like wow i mean it's, it's these moments that even i'm amazed by i mean because i always have guys and men and female who fight but um just the the magnitude and the size of these events um, especially International Fight Week, it's just a mega card. Amanda called me and said, hey, man, I need your help. So I was like, I was actually really honored and, and proud that she called me, you know, to ask for my help. But, um, yeah, you know, it's just MMA, it, it, it can, it never gets boring. You know, I've been doing this over 20 years and it never gets boring. Well, I missed, I missed one there because uh, I didn't realize JDS was an American top team. Is, yeah. How long has he been there? Oh, Junior's been with us for a couple of years. Okay. I didn't yeah, know that. I, I think his first fight with us might have been Ben. No, I think it was even before the Ben Rothwell fight. So mm. he's been with us for a couple of years. Okay. So last time we spoke, uh, we were we were sort of um, speculating on the next opponent for John Jones. Of course, they announced Tiago Santos, which is who we kind of both thought was was going to be the next guy. Um, so I, I talked to you about some uh, strategic, you know, um, openings that, that I've never seen people engage before. And I had Smiling Sam Alvey on here the other day, who's a UFC light heavyweight, and I ran it past him as well. So let, let's revisit that for a second. Um, calf kicks and ruthless aggression. Other than that, though, Tiago Santos is a murderer, right? But what, what are his keys to victory against John Jones? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's such a tough question. <laughs> yeah. You know, you got a few months can, to figure it out. Yeah, being able to execute, being able to execute his John Jones is so difficult because he's so aware and he's so versatile. I mean, he's just so such a, a diverse fighter. But Tiago Santos, what he has to do is he can't respect John enough 
to allow him to sit back and pick his shots. He's got to absolutely put pressure on him and try to match his diversity in terms of striking targets, calf kicks, body kick, body punching, head shot, head shots, takedown attempts. I mean, he's just got to really bring it to John and make John fight him as opposed to like sitting back and kind of going, you know, tit for tat. And that's why these guys end up in trouble. They try to go tit for tat. And for whatever reason, you know, they want to do that when John gets in front of them. But you can't do that against a guy like John because he's going to beat you every time. He's just too long and he's just too too accurate. But Tiago Santos has just got to get really close to him and just try to rough him up and just hit him in so many different spots and just make John fight for five rounds and hopefully catch him somewhere along the way. But that's such a tough task and a, a tall order to ask for any fighter to do against a guy like John Jones. Yeah, I mean, it seems like a lot of guys defeat themselves before they even get in there with them. And and you you actually led your your answer to that question by saying, you know, he can't do that. He can't he can't get in there and be too worried about what John Jones is going to do to him. Yeah, you can't because when you worry about that, you, like you, because John's not really worried about what you're going to do back to him. He's just doing his thing, and. And he sees his opportunities. He sees his openings. He's hyper aware. And when you get in there and you start, you know, you start looking at what John's doing, you're down. You're down. You're, you're, he's already he's already ahead of you on the scorecards. He's already ahead of you just with the momentum he's building on you. You just can't wait for him. You got to really just go out there and just start calculating. Because, you know, like if you were to pick John apart, any one skill set, I don't think he's the best at. You know, I don't think he I don't think he's the best boxer. I don't think he has the most power. I don't think he's the best wrestler in the division, but when you start putting all that stuff together, he just keeps you so, so far off balance. And he's just so precise that you just really got to get in there and go, all right, I'm going to get close to you and I'm going to force you to fight. Yeah. Well, you used an analogy when we talked a few weeks ago and I, I stole that, you know, it's like he, he keeps guys on ice, like, like they're, they're standing on ice skates and he's on regular ground. Uh, that, I think that's a, a fantastic way to look at it because it really is a phenomenal thing. And you're right. I mean, he's not outstanding in any one area. He just has such an amazing fight IQ and excellent composure, probably the best composure in, in the sport. Yeah, no doubt, man. And he just, and he just switches. He's just able to switch his, his disciplines and his attacks, like just effortlessly. It's just one minute he's here. The next minute he's here. And just when you least expect it, like even from the outside, you're watching, you go, oh, my goodness, he just shot a takedown. I didn't see that coming. You know, he's just so he's like a dancer. You know, he's just a fluid. He's as fluid as a dancer. Yeah, he's definitely an artist. OK, so another one, of course, you've talked you touched on this a little bit. Amanda Nunes uh, is fighting. She's defending the Bantamweight title. Initially, I wasn't sure which because she's the, the, the champ champ, your girl. Uh, can't wait to see her back in action. A lot of people are goofing on. On Holly Holm and saying, well, you know, she, how many title shots is this girl going to get? But as you know, that's not somebody you want to take lightly, is it? No, oh, no, no, no. You got to give Holly her respect. I mean, she's never truly been shut out like and embarrassed. I mean, she, you know, the on paper, Cyborg certainly beat her, beat her pretty bad. And, and the numbers were pretty lopsided on paper. But she was never really shut out. You know, you've never really seen her hurt bad in a fight uh against misha tate i mean she won four rounds until she was submitted in the fifth so she's always dangerous she's she's a consummate professional she trains hard she's got a, a great camp behind her she does her homework she's always going to be prepared and even prior to stepping into a cage she was a tremendous boxer so you know she she's disciplined she has she's disciplined so you can't take her lightly but I just don't know how well she stacks up against a motivated Amanda Nunez. And if Amanda is hitting me up now, we're in, in March. <laughs> She's hitting me up now to start getting prepared for a July fight. She seems to be pretty motivated and doesn't want this to, to get close. So Amanda's very Amanda will be tough to beat for anybody when she's a, when she's motivated. Yeah, man, that's uh that's gonna be a great one. I can't wait. Are you wearing a Ben Askren t shirt? I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, speak, speak of the devil. That's that's the next guy on my mind here. Of course, uh, last time uh, you were in Las Vegas, he made his debut against uh, Robbie Lawler. You know, a lot of people wanted them to run that fight back. I didn't really care to see that. I, you know, I felt like uh, he was going to 
face the winner of Till Mosfidal, which is what he wanted. And it looks like that's what's going to happen. So um, what do you think, man? I mean, I, you work with George closely or no? No, man. Like me and George are friends, you know, like sometimes like I don't work with George. He comes in. Hey, like George lives Unless he down sees in this my video with your T-shirt. What's that? I'm sorry. I said, I said, unless he sees this video with your T-shirt. No, no. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> No, he he lives down in um he lives down in Miami. So when he comes up, you know he doesn't he doesn't come up to you know to work on things like that. He comes up to put in his work, like as far as like sparring and testing himself. So he doesn't come up to to just like try to analyze the way I work. And you know, and my and the people I work with, we have kind of a system and a process. So I don't work a lot with George. We're, we're friends though, and I really like George a lot. And he's one of my favorite guys in MMA in terms of his, his ability to speak. Um, he's such a he's a fighter's fighter and he's he should be an inspiration for all aspiring fighters on how to conduct yourself in terms of his his marketability and in the in the way he fights as far as like I'll fight anybody. Um, but him and Ben, like I'm not torn on that fight. I, I want to see that fight. You know, I'm, I'm friends with both guys, but I just I really do want to see it because I think I just love both of them as fighters. Like I love Ben. Like again, Ben's the same way. You, like when he, you put a mic in front of him, put a camera on him, he's great to watch. Um, in terms of fighting, like I've never trained with anybody who's as relentless on the ground as he is when he gets on top of you, and as determined as he is. But so it's a it's a great matchup, and I'm really looking forward to it. I have, you know, I, to me, I don't really care who wins. I, know, I mean, I like both guys, so. I just hope both of them make some money. That's all I care about. You, you mentioned about Masvidal being uh, uh, being an inspiration. He truly is a guy that embodies the American dream. And you're right. He's a guy that uh, uh, is, is just an absolute fighter to the core. He was built for this. Um, he started out in... in uh, in like in Kimbo's like backyard <laughs> backyard brawling, which is actually becoming a thing now. And they're they're going to host an event uh, all these years later. Now they're hosting an actual event in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And I got a press release from him that says you're going to be doing some commentary. Man, well, tell me about that. how did that come about? Like it's kind of funny because I never really saw myself doing that. You know, I'm a reader. No, no, I've I've done commentary plenty. Okay, but associated with backyard brawling, <laughs> yeah. knuckle fighting, right? A couple of years ago, Chris Lido hit me up. This is, you know, he was well retired in his MMA career, and he hits me up a couple of years ago, and he's like, "Hey, man, do you want to fight bare knuckles in in uh, in England?" And I'm like, "Are you crazy? I would never do that." Um, now, r- fast forward a couple of years, here I am, you know, a big supporter of it, and just going, "Man, I, I, I'm doing play by play for these guys," and. And I'm really excited about doing it. Well, one, because of it's a different role for me. I've, I've done color commentary plenty, but this is the first time that I'll actually do play-by-play. So that's a different role for me, and I'm, I'm excited about ch- that challenge. And then secondly, in terms of, you know, the whole bare-knuckle thing, I mean, it's pure entertainment, you know. And to me, that's kind of a release because when I watch MMA, I'm just constantly watching with a critical eye, and I'm studying and I'm figuring out like what these guys are doing and their intent and you know just patterns and I'm just watching it like a scientist. But now I'm finally gonna be able to analyze something, not even analyze it, but just watch it and be entertained and just when a guy gets knocked out, just be able to call it like I see it. Uh, and yeah, and the press release also mentioned that uh, w- with you uh, on the uh, in the commentary booth, you also got Defear Harris, also known as Dada Five Thousand. Um, are, are you like boys with that guy or how do, do you know him from the Miami scene? I've known him for, the thing is, I've known him for years um, back when he actually fought in fight time in Fort Lauderdale when fight time was still a thing. And this was whew, probably seven years ago or so. So I've known him for a couple of years and then he he kind of pop up every once in a while to different places and I'd see him. But and he's always been just a businessman and a hustler. I mean, he's he's a Miami hustler, that guy. So um, you, know, you want to surround yourself with guys that are trying to move forward. And he's always trying to move forward. Everything I've ever seen from him is to move forward. So, you know, he's making moves. So why not Why not join him? Yeah, interesting. Cheyenne, Wyoming. My, you know, b- before we got in there, you were talking about Boise, Idaho being a surprisingly uh, cool and, and hip town. I, I've never been to Wyoming. I, I you know, that, that, that sounds like one of those places I try to stay away from. But who knows, man? Maybe, maybe it'll be. 
Rodney, who you telling me that I'm scared? <laughs> I just I was just happy they said we're flying into Denver. And I was like, all right, cool. I've heard of that before. I know where that's at. <laughs> right, right. Cool. I, I wonder why. They, they must have, because uh, there, there's been some other events that have, have taken place there, and it's it's not too far from me. And I, I wonder if they just have some some different kind of laws, you know, uh, in, in Wyoming that allows people to come in there and, and put on these crazy fights. Well, yeah, the Athletic Commission there, are they are um, they're, they're all for bare-knuckle fighting. You know, they're, whoever I don't know who's in charge of the athletic commission there, but they're they're all for it. And like I've I've like saw like the different uh, pieces that they've said, and they're just they don't they don't think that it's a bad thing. So um, that's that's great. <laughs> all right, so we talked about uh, Ben Askren's next opponent. Let's talk about Robbie Lawler. The last, but definitely not least, your boy is getting uh you know speaking of running it back with Robbie. That's what's going to happen with uh, with T. Wood. I'll be honest with you, man. That that's the fight I wanted. Uh, you know, I prayed to the MMA gods for that fight, just because it, it, it's pure violence. You got two of the best guys, man. And I, honestly, man, the way I see it, if Tyron is able to go out there and, and get another impressive win over Robbie, like he did the first time around, um, that to me seems like a direct road to the title. I think so. Um... It makes sense, and this fight actually does make sense. When Tyra knocked out Robbie, Robbie was a champ. Obviously, he didn't have the belt that long, so they didn't give him an immediate rematch. But I do think that um, the way Robbie got knocked out the first time by Tyron, uh, a guy like that who's been around for so long, he deserves another opportunity to fight Tyron. And this fight does make sense. He, I mean, he just deserves it because Robbie, Tyron is – the best fighter I've ever worked with, but Robbie deserved more than that. He deserved to show that he was better than that, or just give him another opportunity. Now, if Tyron knocks him out again, which is what we're hoping, then, Hey, then that's just what it is. But Robbie deserved more than that. And, um, he, he never was given that opportunity because he didn't hold the belt long enough. So this is his opportunity to get knocked out again, really, but he deserves another shot at Tyron. Damn. Yeah, and, and you know what? Especially if Colby can beat Kamaru Usman once they fight, I mean, I feel like all of that beef and all of that rivalry that built up for so long with with, uh, with Troby Covington and T. Wood, man, we got to have that fight, man. We got to have – we got to see that fight. You kind of have to see it, and if it doesn't happen – if it doesn't happen for the world, we need to like they need to fight in a parking lot somewhere and TMZ needs to capture it because that does need to happen. And that's one thing that I actually feel bad for Colby about is that he put so much work. He invested so much time into roasting Tyron. <laughs> and for two years, he's been he's been <laughs> barking at him from the sideline and it never happened. So that needs to happen. You're right about that, man. Yeah. And I never heard nobody. Trollby Covington. I oh love yeah, him. I've been calling him that for years, man. I told I told that to Chael too. He 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 uh, got a kick out of it. Yeah, man. That that that's. I mean, he made a career out of that whole gimmick, man. Before that, nobody really knew who he was, and he just started talking all kinds of shit. And then, you know, of course, you were you were at the open workouts when he showed up with a megaphone. That that was like, I don't know, man. That that was some. Uh, you know, some people don't like that. I I thought it was kind of funny. I mean, it's disrespectful, but at the same time, it's like, hey, you got people talking about him. Listen, you know, Colby's cringy sometimes to watch to watch him talk, to watch him speak, to listen to him to him is cringy. But he's trying. And it's more than what I can say about a lot of other fighters. I mean, I'm dealing with fighters all the time. I'm like, man, I don't know what to do. I can't get fights. I can't do this. I, you know, nobody wants to pick me up. And I'm like, man, you need to have a certain amount of if not likability, but watchability. People need to want to watch you. And if they don't want to watch you, you're not doing your job. So, um, and Colby's made that apparent that people just want to watch him fight now, like whether win or lose. And he's not the most entertaining fighter. Like he says what he says about other guys being boring or whatever, but Colby's not an entertaining fighter. He doesn't, and it's not his fault because he just doesn't have a lot of finish ability. He doesn't have no power in his punches. He doesn't really have a tremendous submission game. But he fights hard, and he doesn't get tired, and and I, people are going to want to watch him fight. Like when he when he fights, people are going to want to watch it. 
Yeah. And and again, you know, people criticize the similarities to WWE, but I say this all the time. It's like you, you have to embrace some of that because that's basic human psychology. Some of the some of the fundamentals of you know, one of the reasons why WWE is a multi billion dollar company is because they get a reaction and that that's where you have the, the baby face versus the heel, good guy versus the bad guy. It doesn't matter if you love him or hate him. As long as you're talking about him, as long as you're tuning in to watch that's all he's trying to get you to do. Yeah, and understand this too is that, you know, these guys, the are intense UFC, UFC MMA fans, they're living vicariously through fighters. And in, in our everyday life, we can't just walk around and talk trash about people. We can't just punch people in the face. When somebody steals your, your parking spot, you just kind of go, ah, screw you, and then you drive off. You give them the finger and you drive off. So they're vicariously living through fighters. So when they got a guy like Colby who's just, you know, loud mouthing people or they're watching these fights, they're vicariously living through them. So, you know, yes, they they want that. They want somebody who's going to speak up for them because they can't do it themselves. You know, I, I want to ask you your thought. I just thought of this, man, but uh, I've never really heard anybody talk about this. I felt like for the longest time, the UFC didn't want to make the match between Colby and and Tyron when Tyron was still champ you know Dana said multiple times said, well we offered him but he turned it down well yeah but you offered him in September but then you know Tyron then fought again after that and Colby apparently you know felt like he was uh, he was looked over I'm wondering though and, and this is a bit of a I don't know maybe it's a bit of a reach on my part I just think that with the the pasty corn-fed white dude with the red Donald Trump Make America Great Again hat, which a lot of people equate to white supremacy, racism, bigotry. A lot of people think that that's a symbol of those things, you know, automatically. And of course, Tyron, being a strong black man from Ferguson, Missouri, who's also very outspoken against Donald Trump, you know, and, and that whole uh, school of thought. Do you think Maybe it's just a PR nightmare if you try to put those guys together in, in today's climate of race. You know, I never really, you, that's such a strong point. And up until recently, I never really thought that that was the case. I thought that they would want that. I really did. I thought that, you know what, it's, you know, the marketing is, it markets itself. You know, when you, you see Kobe, you know, running around with the Trump hat and, you know, tire, like you said, I, I mean, it's just, the two dynamics of, of each fighter, it, it markets itself and people are going to choose sides and the race war is about to happen and it's just going to market itself and it's going to be great. That's what I thought too. But, you know, the UFC, they I think they know better. And I think if for whatever reason they didn't make that fight, I would not be surprised if that's the reason why they didn't make the fight because more than anything else, I don't think that the UFC really wants that problem. You know, I don't think they want that problem to be in to be associated with, you know, this this racial tension. They don't want that problem. Like Dana does not want problems. He wants things to run smoothly. And with everything that happened with Connor and Khabib and even with with George, like George Masvidal and Leon Edwards, like that fight makes sense now because of the beef they had. UFC is not booking that fight. You know, they're never going to have them two guys in the same place again. They don't want that nightmare, you know, and, and now it just now I'm really strong on my belief that the UFC probably didn't make that match just because they knew the tension that it would cause as far as like black and white. And the UFC probably I mean, I, again, I can't speak for the UFC, but this is just the way I think that Dana and the people at the UFC were like, you know what? We don't really want that problem. We can't have this fight. That's what I think. There, there you go, Coach. I mean, you, you and I are the first people to talk about this and and cover that, and that that's what I've been thinking for a long time. I just never uh, had an opportunity to to express it and really, you know, bring it out and talk to somebody else about it. So I'm glad that I'm not the only one that thought that. I mean, take take a, you know, uh, I don't know, like a like a far a far left like news outlet, mainstream, not necessarily sports. Um, like world star or something. I don't know. I don't, I don't follow TMZ. Yeah, yeah. They could, they could yeah. take a clip of, of, you know, uh, Dana White and, uh, endorsing Donald Trump at the, at the, at the rally. You know, there's a video of that. And then you could take Colby and you could take all these, you know, and he, he said some incendiary comments about Brazilians and things like this. 
And then you also take, you know, sound bites of, of Tyron, who's been vocal about racism within the organization of UFC and just in general, because he's, you know, he's a very much a part of the culture. And and then you could you could mash that all up and you, you could you could twist that into something really nasty. Yeah, you can. Oh, what are you kidding me? Like, you know, Dana spoke at Trump's rally. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and. With all that behind it, it really would make Dana look like he he hated Tyron. I mean, you're right. Like, and people would do that. They would look at that and go, you know, he hates Tyron. Look at him. He's he's speaking on Trump's behalf, and this is a direct reflection on how he feels about Tyron. You're right. That could that could very well much be the case. But and and that fight made sense. Tyron and Kobe made sense, not because of you know the underlying racial tension that we're talking about, but it just made sense for so many other different reasons. The fact that Kobe was roasting him and Kobe never said anything about, you know, the whole race thing. That just was like, again, just an underlying condition of what we're dealing with, but the fight made sense and it never happened. There had to be something more to it. And you're right, man. You, I think you pulled the, uh, you pulled the curtain up on that. And I think that's really what that, that has to be what it was because I can't see any other reason why they wouldn't have made that fight because it made sense. Yeah. Especially after, you know, the second time that they have had an opportunity to book it and, and Kobe is still, quote unquote, the interim champion. But but yeah, he's not, you know, fighting for the title to unify. All right, man, we've been yenting it up here for almost 30 minutes and we haven't even talked about any of the fights. But I do want to touch on some of the because, man, there were some amazing fights this weekend. I don't know how much you got to see. Did, did you watch UFC last night? 